you can make even bigger viruses. And when you do that, it, you use the same rules. You add subunits to each triangular face of the icosahedron. But it turns out as you make bigger and bigger particles, you have to have other proteins in there as well to manage the size, all right? And so that's what we're showing here. The largest viruses have different components. In addition to the ones that make up the shell, they have different proteins that serve different functions. So here, for example, is adenovirus, which is quite a large uh, virus particle. Uh, it's got two different kinds of structural units, the hexon and the penton, uh, and these form the capsid shell. So those two proteins forms the, form the pentons and the hexons in the shell that give you the icosahedral shape. But you can see all of these other proteins, these are all structural proteins that are present in the virion. They have different roles. They don't form the shell. Some of them attach to the receptor. Some are, some are called glue. They, they hold the shell together. This is what stabilization means. And some of the proteins are involved in packing the DNA inside the shell. So what I want you to understand is that we can build wonderful icosahedra by taking a few one or a few proteins and repeating them. At a certain point, you've got to add other proteins in there for different functions as well. And adenovirus is a good example of that. So here is a uh, analysis of adenovirus. Here's an electron micrograph. That's the famous one with, with, the, with the Sputnik look. So adenovirus is an icosahedral capsid about 150 nanometers in diameter. The T number is 25. So there are 25 <laughs> facets for each triangular icosahedral face. It's made up of 240 subunits, made up of uh, hexons and pentons. And you can see the icosahedral arrangement here. So the pentons, the five associated subunits, are at each five-fold axis, and then the hexons are in between. Uh, it also has these additional proteins at each five-fold axis, these fibers and knobs at the end. So at each of the 12 five-fold axes, there's one of these fibers with a little tip, and that's what attaches to the cell receptor. So this doesn't contribute to the basic shell structure of the virus particle, but is an accessory protein needed to attach to a cell receptor. Then there are all sorts of other proteins in here as well. You can see some of these uh, lines here in between the hexons. Those are these so-called glue proteins that are thought to have to hold these proteins together. And then in the interior of the capsid where there's viral DNA, uh, there are proteins that bind the DNA and serve, serve various roles uh, in keeping the DNA there. So that's one example of how when you make a more complicated capsid, you have to have other proteins as well. Here's an interesting example of two concentric icosahedral capsids. So the real viruses, T equals 13, 13 facets per icosahedral face. Um, these are viruses with double-stranded RNA genomes and they're made up of two icosahedral shells. So there's an inner shell, and then wrapped around it uh, is an outer shell. Uh, and you'll see later that these uh, viruses actually never uh, get rid of their genome during infection. So this is a very stable particle, and in fact, many of these viruses uh, infect our alimentary tracts, and maybe that's why you need a double-shelled genome. But there's nothing more than two uh, icosahedral shells, one wrapped around each other. And that is because they're not being aligned by any underlying symmetry. They're simply a, a nucleocapsid, uh, which is the RNA genome, of course. Uh, let's look at just one other large virus, just to give you a sense of how these are built. These are herpes viruses. Uh, herpes viruses uh, have about 80 viral genes encoding in their DNA genomes, and over half of them go towards building the capsid. Capsid is 2,000 angstroms in diameter, contains 13 envelope proteins. Uh, there are four proteins that make up the icosahedral capsid, and then there's what's called a tegument made up of 20 proteins, which is between the envelope and the icosahedron. So here is a cross-section. This is a cryo-EM reconstruction of herpes virus. You can see the icosahedral capsid in light blue, and then there's a, an envelope surrounding it in dark blue, and then there are glycoproteins in the envelope. So this is a very big capsid. Uh, there, are quite a, there are four proteins that make it up, 
Uh, there are 13 glycoproteins embedded in the envelope. And then this orange is the tegument. It's a layer of protein between the capsid and the envelope made up of 20 different proteins that has a variety of functions during infection. This is a very interesting particle because, as I said, it's built with icosahedral symmetry. There's a cryo-EM reconstruction of the particle. But remember, in an icosahedral structure, there are five-fold axes of symmetry. And in theory, they're all the same. They all have the same environment. But on the herpes capsid, one of them is different. And you can see it here. One of the five-fold axes of the herpes capsid has what's called a portal. It's an opening. None of the other five-fold axes have that. So remember, there are 12 five-fold axes in all. One of them on the herpes capsid has a portal. You can see it in this electron micrograph. That's a reconstruction of it. Uh, here's a top view of it. And it's believed that this is how you put DNA into the capsid and perhaps get it out. So at some point you have to put DNA in while you're building the capsid, and at some point you have to get it out as well. So interesting way of, uh, of a spin on icosahedral symmetry is to make this asymmetrical portal. Phages are really interesting in their structures. They are nothing more than an agglomeration of all the things we've talked about. Here is the famous uh, tailed bacteriophage, which you've all seen photographs of. It consists nothing more than a icosahedral head. So the head is built with icosahedral symmetry. It has five-fold axes of symmetry, just as we've been talking about. The neck is made up of a helical structure, very much like the helical nucleocapsids that we've been talking about. And then there's some specialized proteins that are involved in infection, very much like the specialized proteins of adenovirus. You have a base plate, which is involved in sitting down on the host, binding to a receptor, and poking a hole in the host, in some cases, to let the nucleic acid in. And then there's these tail fibers, which are also involved in recognizing the host as well. So the nucleic acid of this tailed phage is contained within the head. And then when the phage finds the right cell on the right signals, uh, the, the hole is poked in, uh, the cell and then the DNA is ejected. It turns out the DNA is packaged in this head at very, very high pressure and it comes shooting out at just the right signal. Now just last year, a detailed structure of this base plate was solved and it turned out to have a spike in it. Okay, so here's the base plate. We're now looking at the bottom of that, of the end of that tail of one of these phages and this is the spike. And the idea is that when this, again, when this phage hits the right cell, this spike jams into the cell membrane of the bacteria and makes a hole through which the nucleic acid can go through. And so a group solved the structure of this spike at X-ray resolution, you know, 1.8 angstroms. And here it is on the right. And you can see this is a, uh, this is a multimer made up of, I think, three different copies of a polypeptide. And look how it makes a real spike. These, these are uh, beta strands, of course, forming uh, the structure from a broad top down to the tip. And this is the tip of the spike that will shoot into the host cell. And these proteins are coordinated by an iron atom uh, right here. And so that's why they call this an iron-loaded spike. So the idea is that this gets jammed into the bacterium, it makes a hole, and then somehow must fall off to allow uh, the DNA to go through. But I, I just think this is a remarkable structure because it looks exactly what you think it would look like, a spike for, for driving through the membrane. This is a Mimi virus whose structure was solved a couple of years ago by cryo-EM. It's huge. Remember, these are 750 nanometers in diameter. It's icosahedral, as you can see. You can probably recognize uh, five-fold axes of symmetry. But it has this really unusual star on one side of the particle. And that was deduced from the cryo-EM. You can see it's not on the other sides, it's just here. Now we don't know what it is, but maybe it's a door. Maybe it opens up to let the genome out. Inside, this is the DNA genome. It's quite big, as you know, and this could be a portal. I think that the really amazing thing is the T number for this particle. 1,179. There are 1,179 facets for each triangular icosahedral face. I think that's remarkable. Now, in particles, there are a bunch of other things that are important for virus replication. There can be enzymes of all sorts, the various polymerases, proteases, enzymes that cap messenger RNA, topoisomerases, 
uh, activators of transcription, things that degrade mRNA, histones, tRNAs, many, many things have been found inside virus particles. So I, I don't want you to leave thinking that it's just structural proteins and some glycoproteins. And we will touch on a lot of these as we continue our discussion. And I wanted to point out uh, two of them that are very interesting. Uh, one, in the capsid of picornaviruses, there is a small lipid present. And so here is the uh, X-ray structure of poliovirus at 1.8 angstroms resolution. And you can see these yellow molecules are uh, where there's a small lipid present in the particle. And there's one per subunit, or uh, 60 times 3, which is the T equals 3 virus, 180 copies of this lipid. There is actually a drug that uh, has been uh, isolated based on its antiviral property that displaces the lipid in this pocket. And here is the pocket where the lipid normally sits, and this is the drug that's fit into it. So this is a drug that had been developed by several companies in an attempt to make antivirals against common cold viruses. And they never were clinically useful because resistance emerged too rapidly, but they turned out to be very important because they revealed the presence of this pore, and they showed that the presence of the lipid is essential for uncoating. So a lipid is normally present here, and we'll talk about next time how it functions, but it's an example of how another kind of a chemical component is present and has functions uh, in a virion. And the other uh, molecule I wanted to tell you about is in the influenza virus virion. So remember, influenza viruses are envelope virus particles, they have glycoproteins in the envelope, as you would expect. Um, and the RNA genome is inside, wrapped up in a nucleocapsid, RNA plus protein. So in the envelope, we have three different kinds of proteins. We have a hemagglutinin, which I showed you earlier. This is the protein that attaches to cell receptors. Uh, we have a neuraminidase, which is an enzyme, and we'll talk about its function later on. But then there is a third protein, and that's called the M2 protein. It's a very small protein, and it's present only in a few copies per virion. This turns out to be an ion channel. And it's the smallest known ion channel. In other words, it pumps ions uh, from the outside of the virion into the interior. It actually pumps protons. And we'll talk about uh, the role of this during infection next time. But you can see this is a model of this M M2 ion channel in the influenza virus membrane. So this would be the viral membrane, phospholipid bilayer. This is a tetramer. This short uh, protein forms a tetramer, which makes an ion channel in the membrane. So those are two examples of other kinds of proteins that are present, which contribute to virion uh, function.